Denninger's a heretic. Denninger's a modalist. He's teaching modalism, Sibelianism, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> well, I got to tell you a little thing to kind of upset some of the people out there that are all excited to, you know, anytime that there's any kind of a thing about heresy, you know, a little heresy trial, they're jumping up and down. We've got him now. We've got him now. You know, he's a, he's a heretic. He's a modalist. Uh, well, actually, no, I'm not. Let me put up the description here. You can just Google this. The description for modalism. You can look this up. It says, modalism, the doctrine that the persons of the Trinity represent only three modes or aspects of the divine revelation, not distinct and coexisting persons in the divine nature. Then it has a thing of music, which we're not really interested in, in that. We're going to focus on that first definition because that's what I'm being accused of. Okay, I'm not a modalist. Why? Because the three, whatever you want to call it, people get it, take my words, and it, I say persons, they go, oh, see, that means separate per Just shut up for a minute, okay? Just listen to me. <laughs> you know, I get so sick and tired of these people. They just, they just like, just watch every little thing I do and anything. I say, Ooh! You know, it's just, just calm down for a minute, okay? Modal, modalism is teaching that the three parts of the Godhead, okay, body, soul, spirit, that there's no distinction between them. I don't believe that way. I'm going to show you today that there is distinction between the three. Okay? Let's go to the infamous passage I did a whole other video on, and we could go all through the Bible. I mean, this could be a huge, huge, drawn-out study, but why? You know, really. John chapter 14, verses 23 through 28. It says here, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. So you see the Father and the Son there. Look at verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. You say, see, how could Jesus and the Father be one and the same? Because he just said his Father is greater than him. Doesn't make any sense. We got you, Brian. No, you didn't. Okay, I'm going to show you why he's saying that his father is greater than him. There is distinction. Okay, can we agree on that? We can agree at least. Yes, there is definitely distinction. Modalism says there is no distinction between Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Yes, there is. Modalism is a heresy. That's why I'm not a modalist. I'm a Bible believer. All right, I believe what the book says. Look over at uh, verse 6. We'll start there. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Okay? Again, you see the three there. The, the way, the truth, and the life. I've talked about that in other studies. We're not going to get into it. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is distinction. Okay? We're not arguing that. Modalism is a heresy. Don't accuse me of being a modalist. I'm not a modalist. I understand what a modalist is, okay? Just read the de definition. Just showed you the definition. Put it up on screen. You know? <laughs> Don't accuse me. Stinking liars out there. Just it, it gets on my nerves after a while. Verse 7. If ye had known me, ye should have uh, known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Who's he talking about? The Father. Okay? You've seen him. Verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus got, just got done saying, you've seen him. And Philip says, well, show us, and, and then you know, that'll suffice us. Then we'll believe. <laughs> Look at what Jesus says. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? In me? You understand? It's one body. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You understand? Well, then you're saying there's no distinction. Oh, there's lots of distinction there. 
We just read about it in the other verses there. And you can go all through the Bible and you can see distinction between God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. There's distinction, but they're one body. Again, I'm going to prove it. Verse 10, Believest thou not that I am... Okay, I already did read that. Uh, but the Father that, I, that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. So, here's how the formula works, okay? If you can show me 1,000 verses in the entire Bible that show the distinctions between God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, okay? If you can show me 1,000 verses, how many verses does it take on my part to disprove that they're three separate persons. One. Okay? You see how that works. It's not, well, we have more verses that we can prove this so we can overthrow your... No, 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 no. All it takes is one verse where Jesus says, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. The Father's in me. That's all it takes. One part of Scripture. One verse. You understand how that works? I know it's, it's again, we're getting into logic and things like that, and, and the enemies of, of the Bible, you know, they, they don't understand logical reasoning and things. You know, if you have, uh, let's say it this way, okay? I'll give you a little lesson in logic. If you say, I've seen a thousand white swans, I can therefore conclude that all swans are white. How many black swans does it take to throw out your theory of all swans are white. One. You're driving along someday and there's a lake and you look and there's a black swan swimming along. Okay. You get out of your vehicle, you look over at it and you go, it's a swan. It's definitely a swan. Did somebody paint that thing black? Oh no, he's been black all of his life. Then you can, then you have to throw out that statement that you made that all swans are white. Do you understand that? That's called logical reasoning. I know it's very difficult for some people. And there's a lot more scriptures in the Bible that talk about Jesus Christ being God the Father and the Father being Jesus. You say, well, then you're saying there's no distinction. Ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posy. <laughs> uh, ashes, ashes, they all, all the heretics go down to hell there. You know, <laughs> I mean, no. No. I'm being sarcastic here, you know. I know that that's enough. You know, people hate my guts because of my sarcasm and things. It's my sense of humor, brethren. I'm, I'm not. I don't hate people. Good night. But my point I'm trying to say is, there is distinction, but they're all in the same body. I'm gonna show you how it works out. Okay. Genesis chapter one, and you'll see a spirit behind all these little contentions about what the Bible's teaching. It all goes back to one very simple little thing for you to understand. Yea, hath God said. Okay? It all goes back to trying to make God into a liar. Let me demonstrate that. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27 says here, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. So in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Okay? Are we created in God's image? You say yes, but you see, that is God the Father. I asked one of these guys one time. I had, you know, back and forth with some of these people. And he said, God is is one you know body up there in heaven and Jesus is another and the Holy Spirit's another. I said, so each one has their own body, soul, and spirit? Think about that one. You know, separate body, soul, and spirit for all three. Doesn't make any sense. Why would the Lord though in this passage say, let's make man in our image? That's plural. Very simple. Because with the Godhead, you have body, soul, and spirit. They're together in one body, but they're able to separate. I'm going to prove that. And then you know what else I'm going to prove? I'm going to prove that you can too. <gasps> Let's look at the scriptures, why don't we? Leave your little emotions at the door. 
or on the other videos that you watch, whatever you waste your time on on YouTube. Go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Say, well, that was just about Adam. Adam was the only one, you know, Adam and Eve were the only ones created, you know, in the image of God. Uh, well, I understand maybe the exact, you know, uh, you know, Adam is called the son of God in one of the genealogy accounts in the Gospels. He's called the son of God. He's the created son of God. Jesus is the begotten son of God. That's a whole another really interesting study. And so, you know, you can say, well, he's a created son. He might have shared some characteristics of his father. I don't know. Uh, so you can say, well, in that sense, he's not made in the image of God. You know, we're not made in the image of God anymore. Say it that way. But the fact of the matter is, the way God, his um, body, soul, and spirit are together in one unit, um, that is how we're made. Let me show you. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. Does that mean that you will be blameless, by the way? No. You should strive for it. You should strive to, for that sanctified life, a life of repentance where you are trying to clean up your life and things. You're never going to achieve sinless perfection. That's not going to happen, but there should be striving for that. You should be striving, having, you know, setting your, your sights high, you know. I mean, not so much so that you're always failing and, you know, whatever. You know what I'm saying. Uh, but let's, uh, let's see here. Are there distinctions in our bodies? Look at my notes over here. Are there distinctions in our bodies? Okay. We do see that we have a body, soul, and spirit. Go to Romans chapter 8. I mean, you could read the whole uh, chapter here. Of Romans chapter 8 and it shows the thing of the distinction between um, the different parts of your body okay body soul spirit is what I'm saying Romans chapter 8 verse 23 let's look at this verse specifically though because this uh, really says something interesting Romans chapter 8 verse 23 and not only they but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the Spirit even we ourselves grown within ourselves hmm waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. No, you're not. What did he just say? Well, your soul and spirit are redeemed. But if you think that this body is redeemed, you're wrong. We have to wait for the redemption of our body. When does that happen? The rapture? It's when it happens. Again, proven in many, many, many studies. I can't go over all the scriptures here. Our flesh is corruptible. So wait a second. You mean to tell me our soul and our spirit want to do different things than our body of flesh? Hmm. How could Jesus Christ be the body and yet say, my father is greater than I? Because the father is the soul. Is your soul greater than your body? And I'm not trying to say you're a god, you're, we're all little gods or something. No, 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 no. I'll probably get that put on me too now. You know, I don't say that. It's ironically, though, it is actually in the catechism. Catholic catechism talks about, you know, man can become gods and stuff like this. Yeah, I've showed that in other studies. Again, look up some of my other stuff. What's going on here? Your flesh, Christian, is prone to all the sins that you used to do in your past. You say, well, then what's the difference? What was the point of getting saved? Very simple. Your soul and your spirit. Your spirit is dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians chapter 2 talks about that. Your spirit is quickened. It's made alive. Now, all of a sudden, it's like having batteries in the remote control. Wherefore, before you were pushing buttons on that remote control, it didn't do anything at all. You didn't have batteries. When your spirit is quickened, now, all of a sudden, you can push buttons and things start to happen. You know? That's kind of funny. That's why, you know, Christians, you know, are things that can push your buttons. You know, you used to go out to the grocery store and you'd hear the rock music and you'd probably be going, yeah, humming it along with the tune. Now you go out and uh, it pushes your buttons, you know, and you go, oh, ah, man, uh, you know, and you hear profanity and you're like, ugh. Or before you got saved, you were swearing and cussing like a sailor, you know. See what I'm saying? Things change when you get saved. The Holy Spirit comes in and he... He makes you aware of some things. 
So in the past, you had no help with trying to sanctify your flesh or trying to get out of this. And you see people and they're sinners and things, lost sinners, and they just struggle and struggle and struggle. They'll struggle with sex perversion. They'll struggle with all kinds of sex perversion. They'll struggle with alcohol. They'll struggle with drugs. They'll struggle with all these things. And it just, they're like, what am I supposed to do? And you hear the scripture where Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Yeah. When you get genuinely saved, the Lord Jesus will move into your body and he'll start to say, Hey, that needs to go, that needs to go. And he'll take time. I mean, I've been saved for a long time now, since I was 25 years old. I'll be 42 here in, well, July 7th. So, however long that is. A uh, week or two. I don't know. Yeah, I guess a week. Maybe a week or so. The point is, I've been saved for a long time now, quite a few years in full-time ministry for 10 years now, and the Lord is still sanctifying things out of my life. You know, and I just need to make that point clear. If you're newly saved, please don't think that you have to get to ultra-high-level Christian sanctification just like that. There are things the Lord's going to sanctify slowly out of your life. And there will be sermons, there will be messages that you're going to hear the first time and you're going to go, I don't see it. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that's true or not. And it'll be months, sometimes years later, and you'll hear the same thing from somebody else or whatever, and you'll go, I need to get rid of that. Man, you know, the Lord will sanctify things out of your life. Just needed to say that. But my whole point is, the redemption of our body is something we have to wait for. Looking forward to it. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, the... the I don't, I don't want to give that away. I'm preparing a future study on some on a guy. It's very controversial, you know. But uh, he was quite a sinner and got saved later on in life. And he's like, I don't know how on earth I can, you know, I just struggle. I wish there was a way I could have peace from the things I did in my past. And I did these horrible things. And I'm just, you know, I just wish that I could have peace from the things that I, you know, the memories just keep coming back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You'll do that as a Christian. You see that with the life of Paul. He'll be writing and he'll be less just like, you know, uh, I remember, you know, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And, you know, faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Yeah, yeah. You will struggle with sin. Whatever sin you committed before you were saved, those thoughts, those struggles are still going to be there through your whole life. But the difference is the Holy Spirit is there to help you fight that stuff off now. And you have an eternal eternal uh, re, um, inheritance. Excuse me, I was thinking redemption. No. Inheritance. You have an eternal inheritance to look forward to. All right? So it's a wonderful thing to get saved. But there is a difference there between your flesh and your soul and your spirit. And again, I have a whole study on that if you want to hear that. Um, let's see here, where are we at? Ephesians chapter 2. If that one didn't blow your mind enough, let me show you another one. Why I'm not a modalist with the Lord, and why I'm not a modalist as a Christian. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm not three different people. I mean, if, if the Godhead is these three beings, and the Lord says, let us, let us make man in our image after our likeness, okay, then there should be three of me walking around. It'd probably come in handy sometimes. I could have one down, you know, uh, changing the oil in the vehicle and one doing whatever else. And my wife's, you know, three and whatever. She could be, you know, have one doing the dishes, one cooking and one doing research or something like this. Uh, now it doesn't work that way. One body, one soul, one spirit, three in one. You understand? We don't worship three gods. And it just cracks me up again. These people, uh, we don't believe, you know, we don't believe in three gods. We don't, we're not polytheistic. We're not, we don't believe in three gods. Yes, you do. Well, no, we believe in God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. But they're all just one God. So three equals one. Okay, sure. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. Here's another good one. If you don't think that there's any distinction, look at this. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace 
ye are saved. There's a quickening. You read about that in verses 1 and 2 there, okay, of the same chapter. But look at verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Huh? I don't even know how that thing works. <laughs> okay. Um, we are seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. What's heaven look like? So, brother, I have no idea. You're seated up there, aren't you? It says so right there. What's it look like? What's going on right now in heaven? You're sitting there. You're in Christ Jesus, aren't you? Well, we can accept that, but we can't accept the thing of Jesus and the Father and the Holy Ghost being in one body. Because we that would mean that there's no distinctions. You see, there's a lot of stuff here on this earth, brethren, we can't wrap our minds around. It's just not possible. You know, and I believe when Jesus Christ came down here and he took upon him the form of a man, he had God the Father in him and the Holy Ghost in him, obviously, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But there's times he's saying, you know, I don't know the day or the hour, only my Father in heaven knows. Why? He's outside of eternity. He's down here in time. And there were things that had to be worked out yet. The Jews were still given an opportunity to accept him as their Messiah in Acts chapter 2. So Jesus can't say, oh yeah, well I know about, you know, definitely it's going to happen. He hadn't even died on the cross yet when he made that statement. You know, only my father knows the time of this thing. Why? He's up in heaven. Can you tell me what's going on up in heaven right now? You see what I'm saying? Well, I'm going to have to figure all this stuff out. Why? So that you can prove how intelligent you are? What are you going to do? Go to the philosophers, the Greek philosophers like the Catholics do? Second Corinthians chapter 12. Oh, Brian Enlinger is getting into some really weird stuff here. He's teaching some kind of a, you know, weird, I don't know what, <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to get that. You people are getting too predictable. I mean, you really are. You, you know, the enemies of this ministry, the, my enemies, people that hate my guts, you're just getting so predictable, you know. Just not much fun for me anymore, you know. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one called up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was called up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. Even if you could know exactly what's going on in heaven right now, because you're seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now, even if you could know it, even if the Lord would take you up like he did with Paul, and I believe that that was when he got stoned, you know, they, the Jews stoned him, I think it was Acts chapter 16, if I'm not mistaken. I have to check on that one. But he gets stoned, and they take him out, of, you know, thinking that he's dead, and he, he stands back up. He's like, okay, let's go back to preaching. <laughs> you know, Gotta love the Apostle Paul. But I believe that's when this thing happened. And he's up there, and he's going, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or out of the body, I cannot tell. He's looking down, and he doesn't see anything. You know? And he's just like walking around going, wow, you know? And what he heard up there, it's not lawful for a man to utter when he gets back down to the earth. You see, God's not going to contradict his word. So when Jesus Christ is walking around down here on the earth, there's a lot of stuff that's going on up there in heaven that even though he is God manifest in the flesh, and he never was not God manifest in the flesh, there was no Christ consciousness that came upon him at his baptism with the white dove flying down and all this new age stuff. No, no. Jesus Christ was always God manifest in the flesh, and he will always be God manifest in the flesh. Okay? But the fact that he was walking around down here, there's stuff going on up in heaven that it's not lawful for a man to utter here on the earth. Why? Because God sees everything 
all of eternity up there in heaven. He's outside of time. He says, explain all this. I can't explain it. I can just believe it. All right? He can understand everything that's going on. Down here on the earth, we can't understand everything that's going on. There are still things that are being worked out. You see? I mean, if God came down and told you the exact day of the rapture, there's a whole bunch of things that would happen that would probably move things away from God's will. All right? You got to remember this stuff. Don't get it caught into this thing of, you know, I mean, think about, think about again, the underlying philosophy here of this Greek philosophy and this, all this intellectualism of, uh, well, we can see here the divine essence of the Father was upon the Son, and yet the Father was not in the Son. And the, all this stuff. What is it? Oh, uh, you can be as God's knowing good and evil. You know, she saw the tree. The fruit there was desired to make one wise. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Hmm. Better be careful. Okay, another place here to go to, Revelation chapter 6. And you know, this is all just like brand new stuff. I mean, I have a study that's going to be coming out after this one about why is this whole thing so important to the devil of this Catholic trinity of these three different beings, three different things. I'm going to be kind of surprised at that one, I'm, I'm sure. It's a very interesting study. Uh, Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 and 11 or 9 through 11, excuse me. Uh, again, we're going to see a difference here between bodies and souls. Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them which were, that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them, that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Okay, another point here to make. I'm not going to ask for volunteers because, you know, there'd be a whole lot of people probably showing up here to do it. But if I had somebody that would say, one of my enemies, and they say, I'm sick and tired of Brian and I'm going to go and I'm going to shoot him. Okay, I'm not telling you to do this. Okay, uh, <laughs> You know, I'm sure that there's people that are jumping up and down and getting all excited. But the whole point is, if I had somebody come and I'm walking out to the vehicle or I'm walking in a parking lot, some store, and somebody comes up and they go, Poof, and they shoot me in the back, because that's how cowards do it. Bang, they shoot me in the back. And I drop the money, boom, and I fall over. Well, what happens? My soul and spirit, are they there inside the, the body of flesh just going, oh, man let's get this funeral over with. I want to get into the dirt and we'll just kind of lay here for a while. And so, no, the Bible teaches absent from the body, present with the Lord. The soul and the spirit leave. Okay? Then my body goes up too, right? No. We have to wait for the redemption of our body. The rapture is going to be the redemption of saved people's bodies. The bodies are corruptible. They're in the ground. They're rotting or rotten, quite rotten. And probably, you know, you get like the Apostle Paul or some of the other, you know, John or James or whatever in the first century. I'm sure that their bodies are just totally into dust, you know, in dirt right now. Probably couldn't find any part of them. But their body, that body has to wait. Okay. And again, if the body is, you know, disintegrated or if you were burned at the stake and it's turned into ashes, the Lord's going to work all that stuff out too. So don't worry about that. But the point is, we are made in the image and likeness of God. That's the whole point of what I'm trying to say here. So Jesus Christ is here on the earth. He's a body. And yet the soul is up in heaven. God the Father. And yet the soul's in Him. Just like we are right now. My body, you're looking at my body, but my soul is inside of my body. How do you know? Because I'm still talking. I'm still alive. Okay? You might want to, you know, if you're one of the enemies here, you know, go back and kind of watch that part over again and let that sink in. Okay? <laughs> you know, when my soul leaves, I won't be talking anymore. You understand? So my body's here on the earth. My soul is in my body, but yet my soul is seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 
and the Spirit is showing me things. But yet not exactly everything that's going on in heaven. So I could be here on the earth and say, I don't really, you know, only what's going on up there. My soul, my spirit would know what's going on, but my body doesn't know. And you mean to tell me that if we can say that about ourselves, proven from Scripture, Jesus couldn't say that? Sorry, I don't believe that. A couple more places to turn to here. Two more places, actually. Go to Acts chapter 17. One of you brought this up in the comments. I thought it was a really good point. Didn't make the, the tie in here. Thank you. Uh, for making a really good point here. Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 23. We'll read that. Okay, it says here, now while, Paul, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. What is idolatry? More than one God. Right? I mean, we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Is that called idolatry? No. When does it become idolatry? When you add more than just the one God of the Bible. Almost like having three gods and then not being able to prove any scripture for it. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Three gods. We're just going to the next point. Verse 17. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers, keep that word in mind, of the Epicureans and the, of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Still put on you today if you just read the Bible. Others, some, uh, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, lowercase g, and plural. Keep that in mind. Because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Lost people look at Jesus Christ and they're saying, this must be different gods. This is strange to me. There are different gods here. That's what lost philosophers think. Verse 19, And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is, whereof thou, or excuse me, may we know what this new doctrine, whereof thou speakest, is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Kind of like today. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Add a little note in here. Unless you use a new version, they say you are very religious. I'm not joking. A lot of the new versions change too superstitious to very religious. Verse 23. That's why you use the King James Bible. For as I, as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the, this inscription, To the unknown God, singular they have all these idols and things like this, and yet they have an altar there, and it says, to the unknown God, one God. What does Paul say? Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him, singular, him, declare I unto you. Now you show me in the next verses 24 down through verse 34, the next 10 verses, you show me one place where Paul says that there are three gods. Show it to me. It's not there. He talks about one God. So what do we have to watch out for? Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. Hmm after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Proven fact. One God, made up of a body, a soul, and a spirit. Three in one. That's what the Bible teaches. That's going to be it for this study. Watch the next study about why is this Roman Catholic Trinity such an important doctrine to Satan. 
there's a future fulfillment. And it's not going to be by God. Thank you for watching.